Welcome to Brain Science, the podcast that explores how recent discoveries in neuroscience are helping unravel the mystery of how our brain makes us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 194. Today, I will be talking with Mary Frances O'Connor from the University of Arizona about her new book, The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Love and Loss. Before I jump into today's interview, I want to address the question that many of you may have. What does grief have to do with neuroscience? The focus of this podcast is understanding how our brain makes us human, and unfortunately, grief is part of being human. To be honest, before reading this book, I was unaware that there were researchers like Dr. O'Connor working to understand how grieving changes our brain, not just as an academic exercise, but to help us deal with this difficult emotion in a truly meaningful manner. Before I jump into the interview, I do want to remind you that you can get show notes and episode transcripts on our website at brainsciencepodcast.com. And you can send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. Brain Science is supported by listeners like you. So if you'd like to help support the show, please go to brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. If you'd like to get show notes automatically every month, sign up for our free newsletter by texting Brain Science to 55444. That's Brain Science, all one word, to 55444. When you sign up, you also get a free gift entitled Five Things You Need to Know About Your Brain. Last but not least, I want to mention that the website's been redesigned, so I hope that you will visit and let me know what you think. Now, let's jump into the interview. As usual, I will ask you to listen past the end of the interview, since I will close by highlighting the key ideas and sharing a few brief announcements. So Mary Frances O'Connor, welcome to Brain Science. It's so nice to be here, Ginger. Thanks for having me. So many of us have lost friends and loved ones and even colleagues during these last two years of COVID, which makes your book, The Grieving Brain, more timely than ever. So I really, first of all, just want to thank you for writing this book. I always ask my guests to talk about how they got interested in neuroscience, but I think my listeners are going to really want to know how you got interested in the neuroscience of grief. I didn't even know there was a such thing. It's a newish field, so that's not surprising that you didn't know. I have always been fascinated by how the brain turns experiences we have in the world, like bonding with a loved one, how does the brain turn that into the firing and the protein folding and all that mechanical stuff in the brain? And when I was an undergraduate, I read about an fMRI machine in my intro to neuroscience textbook. At the time, there were like a handful of them around the world. I just thought this is such an interesting way to be able to capture in real time when people have that wave of grief, what exactly is the brain doing? How does that look? And then if as the brain is sort of grieving right over time, how do things change? And, And how does that relate to the intensity we experience with grief or the changes in in understanding what it means to live without our loved one? So just to give a spoiler, you lost your your mother very early on, right? I did. Would that have been a big motivator for you going into this field, I would assume? You know, I think it's sort of what kept me almost because of having that experience, I felt like I could sit with people who were grieving. It doesn't bother me if you cry uncontrollably. (laughs) And that meant I was really able to delve into the phenomenology for people. What is it really like? And on some level, it enabled me to trust people. So if they say, it feels like part of me is missing, then my assumption is that is how it feels. And there's probably a way in which the brain is doing that that we don't know yet. So let's start out with uh, Mary Francis, with you just giving us sort of an overview of what we at this point in time know about the brain and grief. 
It really is in its infancy, the way you described it. Some of what we know comes from some neuroimaging studies of humans, but we also actually have some animal studies that have contributed a lot to our neuroscientific understanding. And that may seem strange, except that voles, you know, the, the kind of prairie voles, mountain voles you may have heard of, prairie voles mate for life. And so what that means is they have a bond and that bond can be lost when they are separated from their partner. And so that enables all sorts of single electron microscopy, looking at an individual neuron firing, things that, of course, we can't do with human beings. And although the grief of an animal, in fact, they wouldn't even say grief, the loss that a, an animal experiences is not going to be the same as what a human experiences with an extra two pounds of brain. But nonetheless, because it is something that is conserved across social species, it does seem to influence how we understand what's going on. One of the biggest things that we have been able to take away from the neuroscience of grief, as opposed to what we understood before there was a neuroscience of grief, is that the reward system is very important in the process. And that may sound strange. You think, well, but this is a terrible feeling. How is the reward process involved? But some research that I did in 2007 looked at folks who were really having a difficult time adjusting. And in those individuals, compared to people who were adjusting more resiliently to the death of a loved one, those who had more difficulty adjusting showed activation in this nucleus accumbens, which is in the sort of basal ganglia neighborhood, part of the reward network of the brain. So it seems strange. Why are the people who are not responding as well, why is their reward system activated? Well, we were showing them photographs that they had provided us of their deceased loved one. And what became clear to me is the brain is using all its neurochemistry, its dopamine and oxytocin and everything to motivate us to seek out our loved ones and to spend time with them. And so that's what a bond is, really. It's that motivation. Well, reward learning, if you think about it, is when you spend time with them, we're rewarding you in order to get you to do that again, right? And so for the people who were not adjusting very well, when they looked at these photos of people who had died, who they were close to, it was as though they were still predicting that loving experience that would happen, even though, of course, that was not reality for them. And for some reason, the people who were adapting more resiliently, although we still saw areas of related to memory and, you know, perspective taking and all these other things, that was not activated in them. And so this has given us sort of a, more of an appreciation that bereavement is sort of about the loss of reward and not just about maybe grief or pain and suffering. So how does that relate to the idea of this being something to do with learning? Yeah, I really have come to believe that grieving is a form of learning. And a distinction that I make that could be helpful is the difference between grief and grieving. Although, of course, we use them the same way in regular language. Grief is that moment, that wave that just overtakes you, isn't it? And just awful, awful feeling. Grieving is the way that that feeling changes over time as we come to learn how to live in the world with the absence of our loved one. In the neuroimaging scanner, we really are just capturing grief. We're really capturing a moment. There's less than a handful of studies that look at more than one time point in the same individual. What we understand about grieving then is partly extrapolated and partly from animal studies and partly from what we know from clinical psychology. And what that is, is that we have to learn how to live in the world with the absence of this person who is so important to us. Attachment is important to us like food and water. It's important for our survival. 
finding a way to live in the world, to create new attachments or strengthen existing attachments, to make a meaningful life for yourself in the absence of this person, that really is a learning process, sort of like when we leave home or when we move in with roommates for the first time, we have to learn how does that all work. It's different from that, but it is still a learning process of what life will look like now. What makes a good leader? That's the question Lloyd Minor, Dean of the Stanford School of Medicine, explores in his new podcast, The Minor Consult. On The Minor Consult, the Dean brings on top minds in the fields of government, medicine, entertainment, journalism, and business. And together, they discuss the defining moments in their careers and the greatest challenges leaders face today. Some of the guests include former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and Reed Jobs, son of Apple's Steve Jobs. I particularly enjoyed Miner's interview with best-selling science author Carl Zimmer, who offers his perspective on the misinformation campaigns and science skepticism that have raged throughout the pandemic. Check out theminorconsult.com today for episode descriptions and contents. That's the m i n o r consult.com. Or search for The Minor Consult on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. So my listeners are familiar with the idea that the brain is a prediction machine. How would that concept be relevant to our understanding of grief? This has been such a relevant concept for me, and it really is kind of the zeitgeist of the moment of how we think about the brain. It is a prediction machine. It's there to help us figure out what's going to happen next. Well, think about it this way. If you wake up next to your spouse every day for thousands of days, on the first morning that you wake up and your spouse isn't there next to you in bed, it actually isn't a very good prediction that they have died. Death, thank goodness, is a very unusual event. And it takes place in a relationship where we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands and millions even of hours with this person. And so for a while, until the brain really learns to make new predictions, it's almost like they really haven't died. Or rather, I believe, that the brain is consulting two sets of information at the same time. On the one hand, of course you have memories of getting that terrible phone call or being at the bedside as your loved one is is declining. Those memories, though, are in contrast to the attachment belief that comes along with bonding with someone, where that attachment belief includes the idea that you will always be there for me and I will always be there for you. And that you don't even have to be in my presence for me to believe that is true. When you kiss your kids every day and they go off to school and you go off to work, there's no way that we could tolerate that if we didn't have a deep-seated belief that we would all be back together again at the end of the day. And so that belief takes a long time to update and for a long time, is really in dissonance with the memories, the knowledge, the rational thing you can say that the loved one has died. And people even say, I know it's crazy, but I just feel like they're going to walk back in the door again. Yeah. And and I really like this, the way you explained this, because it really makes a lot of the things that anyone who's suffered grief has experienced things that seem illogical, including even thinking you saw the person, yes. right? Yeah. When you know you didn't. And and I, I, I want to read a quote from the book you said on page 22, you cannot force yourself to learn overnight that your loved one is gone. No, you can't. The learning, I think, happens on lots of different levels. And one level that we sort of don't think about a lot is just habit, human brains are incredible at being able to fill in the pattern. This is why we can see faces in the clouds (laughs) and toast and, you know, all sorts of things, right? (laughs) And because of that, your brain is 
expecting to see your loved one or to hear them or to feel them. And so under certain circumstances, kind of especially when we're not paying attention, are moments then that the brain just fills in, ah, and your loved one is here, right? It just fills in all the extra pieces that it is expecting to experience. And that feels very much like you are connected again to your loved one because you see something and and you realize the brain is sort of filled in, oh, that's my loved one over there sitting in the edge of the coffee shop. And then you look again and you sort of realize, no, that can't be true. One of the things that I thought was fascinating in your book in terms of what's going on in the brain was how our brain measures closeness and Mm -hmm. because it's so important for us to know where our loved ones are. Would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this is a dimension that I think is really fascinating. It's come under a lot more neuroscientific investigation in recent years. I kind of start by saying, if you think of the two dimensions of of when and where, here and now, right, those are dimensions that are easy for us to imagine, time and space, right? And the brain encodes those in terms of distance, and it knows when something's far and near. It seems from some neuroscience research that closeness emotional closeness. Like if I say to you, hey, are you and your sister close? That's what (laughs) I mean by closeness. It seems that the brain actually is encoding the dimension of that, the distance of that, in a similar way to the distance of far in the future, far in the past, or a long way down the street. The dimension of closeness is so important to us. The brain is actually measuring it as a type of connection between two people. So some of the really interesting work has looked at closeness in a sort of choose your own adventure story that happens in the neuroimaging scanner. And as that is going on, and the person in the scanner is making these decisions, you know, am I going to reach out to this person? Is this person going to become a friend? The brain has actually got areas that are activated that correlate with the amount of emotional distance then with that person and the one in the story, the character in the story, we can actually see the changes in that dimension across the story as they make decisions. It's just incredible. So I think it's not a big leap then to imagine that we also have this experience with our attachment figures, with our bonded loved ones. So that closeness is so important, knowing that you'll see them and they will be there and they'll, you know, cuddle you or just knowing that that closeness is there helps us to predict, oh yes, we're going to see them again because they enjoy this and I enjoy this. So we're going to come back together. Yeah. So a flip side, you talked about the comparison to when someone in contemporary terms is ghosted. Can you talk a little bit about how that feels in the brain and and why that might have a relationship to grief? I've always been curious about the intensity of anger that people will describe during grief. And the reason I think that's so interesting is even when people can rationally tell you this doesn't make any sense, but I'm so angry at them for leaving me, even when they died of heart disease or some other illness. And as I thought about it, I think what partly happens is when we are in a living, loving relationship, we attend to the closeness dimension of our relationship because it is what does things like, you know, ask forgiveness or or have an argument and say, look, this really hurt me and I want you to apologize for that. We're constantly trying to negotiate closeness, to maintain closeness so that those bonds can endure. Well, under the circumstance where suddenly you just don't feel the person anymore and that the brain hasn't really learned yet that they've died, but rather that they just feel absent then I think it is a natural response to try and explain to the person why it's so unfair that they're gone or to feel terrible guilt about the fact that they're so distant now. 
not in a rational way, but I think that feeling comes from us trying to maintain relationships that happens for years and years. And suddenly in this bizarre circumstance where they're gone, we're not able to maintain that closeness. And it leads to things like feeling angry with the person who's died. Yeah, and I think in that context, you also mentioned in the book that death is is really too abstract for our yeah. brain to really comprehend. I mean, that's it's really a true. pretty, pretty abstract thought, which, of course, we look at history and we see that humans have built whole mythologies around trying to explain the process. <laughs> yeah. It, and in developmental psychology, we actually see as children acquire the different components of the abstract concept of death. So there's a point at which they don't really understand that it means that the person won't come back, or they don't understand that it means that they don't function in the world now, right? Sometimes children think, well, they're just under the ground and they're just functioning under the ground. Or, or the fact that everyone dies for a physical reason. So even watching it develop, according to research, you know, in developmental psychology, we see how challenging it is for the brain to wrap around this crazy idea. And as adults, although there is a rational part of us that can go through the abstract understanding, I believe there's probably also some emotional components that just still are consulting this this bond rather than the rational memories. And you talked a little bit in the book about how it, there's probably an evolutionary value to this behavior of really thinking the person's coming back. I think you, you've referred to, in, in, during that section to that scene in the March of the Penguins. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that for the sake of anyone who hasn't seen it? <laughs> <laughs> so in March of the Penguins, I was just so struck by the fact that this male penguin waits for months, literally more than a month, for his partner to return with fish. And if he doesn't remain, knowing that his partner will come back, then the egg that he is sitting on does not survive. And so that belief that your partner is out there somewhere working for you and is going to return must be so strong as to whether Antarctic winters and lack of food and just staying in one spot, the intensity of that belief really struck me through that. Now, obviously, not that we are descended from penguins, but <laughs> you can see how in social beings, this strength of belief really changes whether our offspring survive, whether our mates survive, and how important then it is for the brain to have a lot of machinery that is really keeping us attached. Because it's not intuitively obvious why that should be true. Right. So what's the role of memory in grieving? Memory is very interesting. And of course, as neuroscientists learn more and more about memory, it turns out there are a number of different kinds of memory. And, and it doesn't really just work like a file drawer, right? That you open the file drawer and pull out a memory and oh, there it is, just like it was when I recorded it originally. But rather more like you're constructing a play and it has all the components to it. But each time you construct it, it's a little bit different. So memory for people who are grieving has a number of really interesting components. One of them is that if we think about our ability to time travel back in a memory, then that same capacity could be thought of about time travel into the future, right? Where we imagine what we might do when we set a goal or uh, plan something. So the discovery in grieving people has been for those who are really struggling to adapt, it seems that the memories that they recall are most often involving the person who has died. So that the memories that they recall that don't involve the person tend to be less detailed and there tend to be less of them. Well, if you think about this time travel then as a capacity going backward and forward, think about then you're more likely to be trying to plan and imagine a future with that loved one in it. And of course, that's not reality. And so trying to imagine a future for yourself, how would I even do retirement? This has always been the plan and I knew how it would work. 
there is sometimes for people who are not adjusting well, a difficulty even being able to imagine what that would be like. And I think it is tied to that same cognitive capacity. So the brain can't just update its predictions and yeah. move on. It's true. It's true. This is, I think, why grieving takes so long and why grief continues to strike us many, many months and years after the person is gone. I want to take a moment to remind you about my book, Are You Sure? The Unconscious Origins of Certainty. You can buy Are You Sure? in either paperback or ebook format from your favorite online store. But if you live in the continental United States, you can also buy an autographed copy. To learn more, email me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. So I know there's going to be some of my listeners who want to know, well, okay, where's all this going on in the brain? I mean, I know that when you first started, imaging wasn't very accurate, but you That's still right. had one of the very first MRI studies of, of grief, I think. Yes. What year was that? It came out in 2004 and was, yeah, the first study done here at the University of Arizona. So now that, you know, a lot has been done to improve the accuracy of, yeah. of this work, because, I mean, I had William Udall on the show. I don't know if you right. remember him. I think, you know, he was very critical. And yeah. he would have said, it, you know, if he was alive, I think he would say that grief is too poorly defined to try mm -hmm. to study with an fMRI. Because mm -hmm. I remember that he was very much against trying to study psychological things because he yeah. felt they were not well enough defined. But what do we know? One of the things that I think has really changed is our understanding that it is whole networks and not single areas, of course, that are activated whenever we're doing any sort of mental function. And I think that a recent study is still under review that was done by my graduate student, Saren Seeley, was a default mode study. So asking people to be in the scanner and just Whatever came to mind was fine. They were just in a resting state. And taking the data then from that resting state, she was able to look at the different networks that are connected, areas that are more connected with each other when people are simply resting and they had previously done a grief task. So not surprisingly, probably their mind wanders again to the person who has died. But there just there was no task. So she looked at what areas of the brain were connected in these different networks when people were just resting in the scanner. And what was fascinating was something called dwell time. And so this is, we have different states where particular areas of the brain are more connected. And then suddenly we'll have a different state where it's a different set of players in this network that is very connected. And she discovered there were four states that were really clearly distinguished during this time period. Now, what's interesting about it is the people who are having the most difficulty adjusting, they tended to have more dwell time in one of those states than in the others. And although we don't know exactly what it was they were thinking during that particular dwell time, we know clinically that people who ruminate and get stuck in particular thought patterns are also the people who tend to have the most difficulty adjusting. And so the idea that there may be particular attractor states, right, that our brain gets into, particular mindsets, that because we dwell there longer could actually make it more difficult to adjust is just the very beginning, just such a tantalizing finding that needs more work, but certainly might lead us to understand these folks who who are not adapting very well. Right. Almost like getting the wrong habit. Years ago, I interviewed Norman Doidge, and he, he used the analogy of like, if you went skiing and you just went down in the same set of ski marks or whatever, you get stuck in a rut and then you can't get out because the rut gets deeper and deeper. And he, he called that the dark side of brain plasticity. And it sounds like that might be something like that going on. So most people, well, probably of a certain age, have heard about the so-called stages of grief. So I thought it might be good to address 
talk a little bit about the origins of that model and and why it's been replaced. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who developed those, was really a pioneer. She was a psychiatrist who was studying terminal illness and the grief that people experience. And the revolutionary thing she did was she interviewed them. And listened to them. And she listened to them. And she believed what they were saying. And then... If that wasn't remarkable enough, she trained medical students and nurses and chaplains and social workers to also talk to them. And she wrote a book in 1969 called On Death and Dying. And those experiences that people were having, grieving their own life and then later applied to grieving the death of a loved one, are still accurate descriptions of things that people experience. People experience anger. They experience depression. They experience sort of denial, you know, periods where, they, where they're where they just completely avoiding what's happened. What's distinct from that original work that she did was that we know now people don't go through all of anger and then move on to some other stage, or all of depression, and then move on to some other stage. But rather, more recent research by Holland and Niemeyer suggests that over time, acceptance tends to increase, and yearning tends to decrease, but not in linear stages, that there's very much ups and downs. You can even think about, you know, during the holidays or the person's birthday, your anniversary, there's probably going to be more grief around those periods. It doesn't mean that over a longer period of time, you can't see an increase in acceptance. And this is where the problem came in. People began to think of it as a prescription for how to grieve rather than just a description of what people were experiencing during grief. Here again, I think that distinction between grief and grieving is very helpful. So she was describing grief, those strong emotions people have, but not so much grieving. And we know from work by, uh, say, George Bonanno from Columbia University, that we can trace these trajectories over time now with much larger samples where we're re-interviewing the same person multiple times. I actually remember reading On Death and Dying back in 1978, before I went to medical school. So I went into medical school with this, and this was long before the existence of palliative care. So it sort of set me in, you know, in a different mindset from most of my classmates. So I know that you did a postdoc in psychoneuroimmunology, and I'm just wondering, you spent quite a number of years in that field. How is that relevant to your work with grief? There is a whole other aspect to my work, which isn't really in the book, which is what happens in the immune system, the cardiovascular system, the endocrine systems after the death of a loved one. So it was really my fascination with a fact from grieving that made me understand the brain and the body really are impacted, really are encoding the death of a loved one. And it is this, a married man whose wife dies, in that next three to six months, the risk of his own mortality is almost twice as high as a man who remains married. And I can't think of a clearer impact on the body than mortality, right? So here's this sort of psychological event, we might think of it, the death of a spouse, and it being incorporated into the body such that that person actually dies. It is true in women as well, not quite as high a risk ratio. And so we know now as we sort of start to try and tease apart what's the mechanism going on there, that there are changes in the cardiovascular system and the immune system. These are on average, so not everyone experiences them. And generally, they are not very long term. So, as I said, primarily in the more acute grief, for example, we know that blood pressure often rises in people. And it's only a few, you know, millimeters mercury, but it turns out a few millimeters mercury can really have an impact on cardiovascular health. And we know, for example, that people are at higher risk for things like pneumonia and sepsis when they have recently lost a loved one. So really digging into what those mechanisms are is fascinating. The piece I will just add at the end is about how the brain gets involved. So I think it's interesting to look at both, that you don't want to look at them completely disconnected. They, turns out, live in the same place. (laughs) And 
I did a study looking at levels of inflammation and also looking at levels of heart rate variability, which is just our ability to sort of regulate the pace of our heart in response to breathing, a sign of good cardiovascular flexibility. Each of those people who had high inflammation, people who had low cardiovascular flexibility, when I looked at the brain imaging in these same people, the same area of the brain was correlated with both of those physiological measures, the subgenual anterior cingulate. And interestingly, this is an area we know also to be important in depression. And we know there are these connections between inflammation, cardiovascular disease, and depression. So I think there's so much more to be done, but the idea that this is all interrelated is just fascinating. Right. I mean, it's really important to remember that the brain is in a body and it's part of the body. And that's a theme that I have covered many times. In fact, the most recent episode of the show is called, What Does It Mean to Say That the Mind is Embodied? Mm, wonderful. <laughs> so that will fit right in. I wanted to talk about Jacques Panksepp's work because he was on the show several times before he died. And he's actually one of my listeners' favorite all-time guests. And he never told me, you know, about his daughter's death. Would you talk a little bit about how his idea, you know, of the panic grief, I don't want to use emotion, but, you know, how that relates to this? Young Pexip had such interesting ways of understanding constructs like grief and panic. He actually called it the grief slash panic system. And he did that again by looking at some animal work, animal neuroscience. But I think this is maybe the easiest way to imagine for your average everyday person in the world. Think of that moment where you turn around and you can't find your kid. You're in the grocery store and they're just gone. And that feeling of utter panic is, I believe, what he was talking about. When we are separated from our loved ones, there is an instantaneous stress response that is very specifically worked out in the brain anatomy. And other researchers since Jan Panksepp, including Oliver Bosch at the University of Regensburg, has looked at when a bond is formed, it's almost like the cortisol system, corticosterone in, in animals, but it's almost as though that, that system gets cocked like a gun. And so when separation happens, that is the then initiating event for this increase in cortisol. So it isn't that something has to sort of be initiated, but rather it is ready to go when separation happens. Thinking about acute grief and separation in that way helps to explain some of the intensity that we experience. That bond has already set us up so that when there is separation, it is an immediate response. Have you seen anything different during COVID that relates to to your work. I mean, I, I get the feeling that there's a lot of un, unprocessed grief going on, even among healthcare workers, just from, from losing so many patients. What's your take on that? There are many different levels I could answer that on. I think we do best with grieving, as with any kind of learning, when we have the time and support to really take an opportunity to figure out what's going on, to learn something new. And for many people, the level of stress that was going on and the amount of social isolation that was going on, those combined to create not a great environment in which to grieve, in which to learn what does it mean that this person is gone. When you add to that, that many of these deaths, not even just from COVID, but deaths that occurred in institutions like a hospital, an ER, a long-term care facility, many of those deaths occurred without the family at the bedside. And I think memories are created differently when we don't get to sort of see that progression. And so I don't think that is irrevocable. I think that that has led to uh, much greater acute grief. 
But here's the thing. Human beings are remarkably resilient. Think about Zoom funerals. Who on earth would have ever guessed we would have something called a Zoom funeral? And yet, because the motivation for social connectedness in human beings is just so strong, like hunger and thirst, we find ways to create social connection so that we can continue sort of these social processes. And because ritual is often important to us, the opportunity to have that social support and say goodbye and reflect on a whole lifetime, many people in the research that I've been doing during the pandemic said that Zoom funerals were often very intimate and enabled people to see each other's faces and and really tell stories in a way that everyone could hear and things that you wouldn't necessarily have expected to be a benefit. There were plenty of non-benefits, don't get me wrong, but I think the resilience is something that's hard to ignore. Because we know that the rates of mortality are so high, it means the rates of bereavement are so high. There's an estimate from sociologists that each COVID death led to nine family members who are grieving. And so now that's close to nine million people, right? So given the sheer numbers of people who are bereaved, it means that we're going to have more complications just because even if the same percentage developed complications, right, that's just a larger number. But in addition, many people going through it at the same time can either lead to a feeling of camaraderie, this is the human condition, or can lead to a feeling of isolation. And it's the isolation in the midst of grief that I think can be most damaging. I want to take a moment to mention our longtime sponsor, Text Expander. The way we work is changing rapidly. You can make work happen wherever you are by saying more in less time and with less effort using Text Expander. You'll never need to copy and paste repetitive responses again. With Text Expander, your knowledge will always be at your fingertips with a quick search or abbreviation. Just type a few characters to trigger your snippet, and the content expands anywhere you type. It's that easy. If you want to learn more about how to use Text Expander, go to textexpander.com forward slash blog. I literally use Text Expander every day, and I really appreciate that it is available on Mac, Windows, Chrome, iPhone, and iPad. Brain Science listeners get 20% off their first year. Just visit TextExpander.com forward slash podcast to learn more about Text Expander. That's TextExpander.com forward slash podcast to get 20% off your first year. And don't forget to tell them that you heard about it on Brain Science. You included a story in the book that struck me because I do palliative care. And this particular story, you talked about one of your clients who was feeling guilty because she wasn't at the bedside. That really struck me because that's something I, I don't necessarily see that end of it. But what I see is I see the wife who stays at the bedside endlessly and finally at one point has to go take a shower or something and the person dies. And I mean, I've long ago taken to telling them that this might happen. In fact, I try to say, you know, he may be holding on for you and he may wait until you're gone. I say he because I work mostly with veterans or mostly men, but he may wait until you're gone. And when I read what you wrote about that person, I thought, I'm so glad I do that because maybe I'm doing something to keep that guilt from happening. And there's a study, pre-pandemic study by Otani and colleagues that looked at, and this was also in a palliative care setting, in a cancer palliative care setting. They looked at people who had had a chance to say goodbye, and then people who had been present at the moment of death. So those two things, of course, are not the same, right? You can say goodbye in the hours and days before, especially when it is a known thing that this person is terminally ill. And what they discovered was it wasn't actually being present at the moment of death. It was getting to say goodbye. And boy, our healthcare workers have just been 
phenomenal. So when I'm doing these interviews of people who are grieving during the pandemic, they talk about the lengths that healthcare workers went to, to try and connect them with their loved one who was dying. Everything from here, let's use my phone and just get you on FaceTime with him to under these circumstances, we can find a way to get you into the hospital to we're going to release him home to the family. There's these precautions that you're going to have to take. But if that's something you want to take on, it can be important. Such a wide range that, of course, varied according to current levels and protocols and so forth. But so much went into trying to help people get a chance to say goodbye in the midst of such an onslaught of work like we've never seen. My husband died suddenly, and I can say that the worst thing about it was the not getting to say goodbye. So what exactly is complicated grief? Everybody's kind of, maybe not everybody, but lots of people have heard that there's a such thing called complicated grief. Now, according to the DSM and the International Classification of Diseases, the ICD-11, we call it prolonged grief disorder. And what that means is about a decade and a half, almost two decades now of research has gone into what are some symptoms that we could see hang together in a person who's not adapting very well so that researchers and clinicians know that they're talking about the same phenomena when they're looking at someone. It it creates better communication. That prolonged grief disorder really occurs in a very small proportion of people. So among bereaved people, it is one in 10 or maybe even one in 100. So it is a very small proportion. And what that entails is really primarily that the grief people are experiencing is preventing them from really functioning in their life. And I don't just mean, can they work an eight-hour day? It's not quite that capitalistic from the perspective of the clinician, at least. It means, are they able to listen to music? Are they able to feel loving toward their grandkids? Are they able to make plans for the weekend? These sorts of kind of really basic functions that for some people, they get derailed. And it's not that we're trying to suggest that some people shouldn't have grief, but rather that we want the grief to be a natural process and not have some of these complications, which is why I like the term complicated grief, that can really derail that natural process. For me, the most important reason to have this diagnosis now is that there have been a number of randomized clinical trials looking at psychotherapy interventions that are very effective and actually can help people who've had prolonged grief disorder for a decade really to function better. And that was randomized control trials where you compare a depression treatment to a treatment for prolonged grief disorder. So the control group is still getting treatment, is still getting psychotherapy, and these targeted interventions do better. Wow. I know you've got a tight timeline, so I want to just ask you if there's anything else that you want to share before we close. I think the only thing we haven't touched on today here that I have found people experiences as quite helpful when we were talking about dwell time and and the thoughts that people can have, there's something that I call the would have, should have, could have. And these are these perseverative thoughts, these intrusive perseverative thoughts, just ruminating about if only I could have gotten them to the hospital sooner. If only the doctor would have ordered that test. (laughs) All of those infinite number of scenarios that we run out in our head. But if you think about it, each of those virtual realities that we're playing out, they all end in, and then my loved one didn't die. And the reality is that they did die. And so the difficulty with spending a lot of time in the would have, could have, should have, although it is natural and it is going to happen, the difficulty with spending a lot of time there is it takes you out of the present moment where you are carrying the absence of your loved one. And you do have to figure out how to construct a meaningful life and love your grandkids and do things in the world. So I mention it because... I think it is a type of thought pattern that people can come to recognize in themselves and can think, hmm, 
maybe this isn't the most productive thing. Maybe I can shift my environment, you know, go for a walk or something and sort of get out of this mental place that I'm in. And by doing that, really attend to what's going on in the present, uh, what both positive and negative things are, fe- am I feeling right now to better understand and, and learn the way that grieving is. You have really showed us how an interest in science can go in just about any direction. So what advice do you have for students who might be interested in going into science? To stay curious. And those questions that you have, write them down. I have a a file that I call my ideas, right? And many of them are crazy, but many of them have led me to how could I investigate this? And how could I test that? But it's the curiosity that is the motivation. It has to be sort of a genuine curiosity. What is the importance of this question that I want to ask to other people in the world? When I was early on, people told me, you can't just study grief. You're going to also have to study depression and PTSD. And, you know, there's not enough there. And I thought, that's just not true. It is true right now, but we can create a science around these questions. And, and so I really persisted because I was curious. So that, that would be my, my recommendation. And since your field is so young, you'll have to come back on. And I need more colleagues. <laughs> yeah, you come back on in five years. And, you know, I've been doing this show 15 years. So five years is not that far away. You come back on and tell me where things are going. I love that. Thanks, Great. Ginger. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me. Have a good day. I want to thank Mary Frances O'Connor for taking the time to talk with me about her book, The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Love and Loss. I would love to hear your feedback. You can write to me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. You can also get complete show notes and episode transcripts at brainsciencepodcast.com. If you haven't been to the website for a while, I hope you'll visit and send me feedback about the redesign. Before I review a few key ideas from today's episode, I want to remind you that you can also get show notes automatically each month if you sign up for our free Brain Science newsletter. Just text Brain Science, all one word, to 55444. That's Brain Science, all one word, to 55444. Four, four, four. When you sign up, you get a free gift entitled Five Things You Need to Know About Your Brain. Brain science is independently produced and it relies on the support of listeners like you. To learn more about how you can support the show, please go to brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. There's a premium subscription as well as a Patreon option. Of course, even if you can't afford to support brain science financially, you can help by subscribing or following us in your favorite audio app and by telling other people about the show. The Grieving Brain, The Surprising Science of How We Learn from Love and Loss by Mary Frances O'Connor is a book intended for readers of all backgrounds, though obviously you are more likely to find it interesting if you have actually experienced the loss of a loved one. As Dr. O'Connor noted, during the pandemic, many people have suffered grieving in isolation, and that is one reason why I feel this is an extremely timely topic. I always talk about how our brains make us human, and grief and grieving are universal experiences of being human. Even so, until I read The Grieving Brain, I did not know that anyone was studying the neuroscience of bereavement. It's a very young field, but researchers like Dr. O'Connor have already made discoveries that may help those who are suffering. I want to start my brief review by mentioning the difference between grief and grieving. Grief is that moment, that wave of feeling that feels overwhelming and horrible. Grieving is a process that occurs over time as we adapt to the loss of our loved one. When it comes to the so-called normal grief, there are two key ideas. One is that from the standpoint of the brain, grieving is about learning that your loved one is really gone forever. 
Because we are a social species, we appear to devote significant brain resources to tracking our loved ones, not just in terms of their location in space and time, but also their psychological closeness. When someone close to us dies, our brain struggles with this sudden change. A good analogy might be phantom limb pain. Even if a person knows their limb is gone, they can't will the pain to go away. Our difficulty with grieving may also reflect the limits of brain plasticity. The second key idea is that all the seemingly crazy things people experience during grief and grieving make sense if we remember that learning this new reality represents a significant challenge to our brain's predictions. We need to give ourselves and others time. Don't expect to just get over it by the force of mental will. As O'Connor wrote on page 22, you cannot force yourself to learn overnight that your loved one is gone. Fortunately, most people are able to cope with grief in a resilient manner and return to meaningful lives. Those with complicated or prolonged grief can benefit from treatments based on our increasing understanding of what happens in the brain during grief and grieving. Now, before I close, I want to thank everyone who sent me congratulations about my induction into the Podcast Hall of Fame. This episode is releasing on March 25th. 2022, which means that you may be listening to it on the same day that this event occurs. So anyway, thank you to all listeners, because without you, I would not have made it through these 15 plus years of podcasting. And I hope to continue on for the indefinite future. I'll be back next month with another episode of Brain Science. Until then, I hope you'll check out my other podcasts, books and ideas, and grain rainbows. Thanks again for listening. I look forward to talking with you again very soon. Brain Science is copyrighted by Virginia Campbell, MD. You may share the show with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please write to brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com for permission. The theme music for Brain Science is Mind Fire, written and performed by Tony Catraccia. You can find his work at syncopationnow.com.